Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for coming out tonight to hear this talk from uh, Donald and myself. Um, we want to introduce you to an important uh, local history source tonight, which has uh, uh, recently uh, come to the Kikubri History Society. And uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, an introduction to the author of, this, uh, of these memoirs on, on, uh, on Twynham and the area generally. They were written by uh, fleet engineer John McKee, and uh, I'll be talking about him uh, in the first part uh, of the presentation this evening. And then I'll be handing over to Donald, who will be talking, uh, well, actually reading excerpts um, from the, the memoirs, and uh, particularly those relating to the history of Twynham, or that part of Twynham Parish. I think we might disappoint Mike in that we won't be talking about Twynham Village. It'll be the parish, and a fairly distant part of the parish. It's actually near a borg, as we'll find out. So if anybody wants to leave now, <laughs> at least. Uh, it it, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not getting the money back. Um, but I'm, I'm really pleased that uh, I managed to persuade uh, Donald Henry to, to help me this evening, because Donald is actually the great, great grandson of the author of these memoirs, John McKee, RM. And we'll be looking at a family tree uh, in a little while, actually, and Donald, I'll sit down and Donald will speak to that uh, at, at that point. So, let's see the man himself. No? It was working. Yeah. Ah, good. Right, if you do that. <laughs> so here he is, John Mickey, born 1821, um, died in his 94th year in 1915. This is a picture of him taken in um, probably about 1900 when he was 79, a very sprightly, uh, fit looking man, and that's, that was a characteristic of him. I think throughout his life, um, very energetic, very able, particularly technically able, um, very enthusiastic, uh, had a very active retirement as, as we'll see. And in fact, when th this uh, particular photograph comes from an article about him that was written uh, in the Galavidian magazine in 1901, uh, when he was actually described as well known as the grand old man of the Stuartry. So, um, that's it. Makes me think who we might give that title to today. But uh, in, the, in 1901, he was a grand old man of the Stuartry. Um, he, uh, he grew up, uh, born in 1821, as I mentioned, grew up uh, on uh, High Nunton or North Nunton Farm in the parish of, of, uh, of Twynham. And he died in 1915 at the age of, of 93 at his house in Ankerley in St. Mary Street. Uh, next slide, please. So, <laughs> that's not my slide. <laughs> So, yeah. So that was a brief introduction to the man himself, the author. What about the memoirs? Uh, well, this is the first page of the memoirs. <clears throat> it's difficult to actually know what to call this. Sometimes these papers are referred to as a journal, uh, sometimes as a diary. Uh, but I think probably memoirs is the better uh, word for them. They, they actually take the form of a letter. You can see that uh, it begins, my dear Nor. And that's, that's the shortened version of his, 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 his son's name, Norman, Dr. Norman McKee, who was, a, uh, was actually a medical doctor in Newton Stewart. Uh, but he's, he's sitting down and he's writing his reminiscences for his son, Norman, who himself was a keen local historian and, and wrote a very uh, interesting article for the Galavidian magazine again about the origin of the McKee family 
um, and the various McKee Galloway families. Of course, it's one of these old Galloway names like McDowell, for example. McKees have been uh, around since the medieval period and, um, and, and, and so on. It was, we don't exactly know when this was written, he didn't date it, um, but uh, from, the, from the subjects that he talks about, it's probably in the 1880s. Now, this is a very, very long letter. This is page one you're looking at, but there are another 441 pages. <laughs> uh, amazing, he, he obviously didn't do it in a night. And um, much of the, uh, well, well, the original of this letter is, is actually in the National Library of Scotland. It was donated to the National Library by one of, um, uh, one of McKee's uh, grandsons. Um, but we've been very fortunate in that uh, Bud Gordon presented a copy of, of the uh, photocopy of the, um, of the memoirs to the Society well, about 18 months ago now, I think. And um, Jimmy, the late Jimmy Gordon, seems to have copied it. Uh, I'm not quite sure how he did that, whether he went back to the National Library and said, can you supply a copy? Um, it must have been a very expensive photocopy bill, 441 pages, but nevertheless, um, it was given by Bud Gordon to the Society, to Helen, and it provides an opportunity, provided really the opportunity for us to uh, read through it, look at it, and uh, really establish the value of it as a, as a local history resource. And I hope by the end of the evening you'll agree that uh, it is a very good source. Now, I'm going to sit down now and hand over to, to Donald, who will we'll take us through the, the family tree. Thank you, David. Um, right at the top there, there's uh, James McKee, who married Grace Charteris, but sometimes spelled Charteris. Um, next line down, um, we have in uh, uh, sorry, eyesight. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes. John's first wife, John McKee's first wife was Jean Bell, but she died relatively young, um, I believe in the south coast of, uh, of England. And he remarried a Mary Carnahan. Uh, uh, she never had any offspring. Uh, but funnily enough, the name Carnahan appears later. Um, the letter was written to Norman, who's, uh, who's, uh, whose name appears on the left there, highlighted. Um, we don't know of any offspring from him. His uh, sister, Grace, again, that's a repeat of the name Grace, which oddly enough appears in my mother's middle name, uh, second row from the bottom. Um, Grace married John Anderson, who was the founding partner of the local law firm Muir and Anderson, who had their offices in the, bank, the back of the Bank of Scotland. Um, and they were subsequently taken over by Williamson and Henry. Uh, no connection with my name. Uh, th that Carnahan name reappears um, in the middle of her son, David Carnahan Anderson, because they thought the world of Mrs. Carnahan, uh, Mary Carnahan rather, um, who had become the stepmother to the, uh, to the lineup of uh, four Norman, Cuthbert, Grace, and Flora. Uh, Cuthbert died in infancy. Um, uh, David Carnock and Anderson is buried up at Twynham, um, as is my grandmother, Margaret Mitchell, um, locally known as Meg. That was my mother's mother. Um, so, um, that uh, the, the name Grace and my mother's middle name uh, appears to go back a long way. Uh, and um, then I come, I appear at the very bottom in red. So the red line shows you from top to bottom uh, how we get from uh, the, the, the author of the letter, John McKee, down to me. Um, is there anything else to say? That's all right. Okay, thank you. 
Oh, thank you, Donald. Thank you, Donald. That's, uh, that's established your credentials, I think, yeah. uh, for the evening. Um, so I'd like to show you, uh, again, carry on looking at the life of, uh, of uh, John McKee. And we're looking at a, of a, a, a county map by uh, Thompson, uh, dated to 1821. So that's actually the year of the birth of, uh, of, of John McKee. And uh, circled in red um, is the site of the farm, uh, High Nonton. Um, and you can see it's, uh, it's within a tongue of um, Twynham Parish that runs down the side of the Dee towards, uh, towards Borg. So as, a, as I mentioned, a, a sort of remote part of Twynham Parish. Um, across the, across the Dee, St. Mary's Isle, you can see the um, St. St. Mary's Isle estate, the seat of the Earls of Selkirk. And the farm was actually part of the very extensive uh, Selkirk Estate, which uh, extended on both sides of the Dee, uh, right the way up into Kelton Parish and down, in fact, through Twynham and into uh, into Borg Parish, as far as, as Ross Farm, for example. And then um, highlighted or circled in yellow that you can see there is the uh, is the school that uh, that, that, that uh, John went to uh, up to the age of fourteen or fifteen, we think, and that's Borg Academy. Um, uh, and for him, it would have involved a about a mile and a quarter walk through down farm tracks uh, to the school. So uh, not so distant, really. But um, I think when you read accounts of this period, you find kids walking three or four miles to school. So it's actually quite a short, relatively short walk for him. Uh, next slide, please, Scott. And um, this is a this is an estate map of the. Uh, belonging to uh, from St Mary's Isle Estate, um, it was surveyed by uh, an Ayrshire surveyor called uh, John McKinley about 1810, and uh, the original of this is actually in in the uh, Centre for British Art at Yale University in in the States, and it shows the Nuntons. In fact, you've got both um, north and south, or high and low Nunton. So our farm. This is, the, this is the farm uh, that John's father, uh, James, farmed, or shown in yellow here. It looks like that originally maybe there was one land holding here, and there's been a, a fairly neat division across the two to create north and south or high and low Nunton. Um, next slide, please. And that's a detail really from the, uh, from, from the last estate plan. And we can see Nunton here uh, with a steading uh, formed of three buildings. We've got the farmhouse and probably two barns there. Um, and round about, you get some idea of the landscape, fairly hilly. It, was, it seems to have been largely a, a cattle raising farm, uh, maybe some sheep as well. Uh, but we've got things like little, little lockums there, one there, one further up here. We've got an area of plantation here which although on the property on the farm was really out of bounds to the tenants, the, the plantations were the reserve of the, of the estate. Um, it was very rarely that the, the tenants got any access to the wood there. But we'll, we'll hear an example of an occasion when, when they did in, in one of the readings, which uh, Donald will give. Um, and what else? Oh yes, the all important moss down here, because in the absence of being able to forage for wood, we depended on peat, and uh, within the uh, memoirs, there's a lovely account of peat digging and the various process involved in extracting peat and keeping the pigs away from trampling on the peat and other animals and so on. Well, we'll not be hearing that one tonight, but uh, that's almost certainly the, the peat moss which, uh, from which the fuel for the uh, farmhouse fire was, was, was obtained. And of course, the fires needed to be kept all the year round, going on all, all year round. And uh, I mentioned, yes, that uh, John went to school in Borg and his route would take him, I think, uh, up north through the farm and then, sorry, up, up west uh, through the farm and then, then, then uh, south down to, down to Borg. Next slide, please, Carl. So he, he'd, uh, he'd, he'd be going to Borg Village you know, every day from the age of five or six to, to 14. 
and you can see this is a view from the north you've got the parish church on the hill there and uh, this is the academy where, where he received his schooling next slide please that's just detail of the same um, picture there borg academy was really uh, one of the leading schools in the um, in the Stuartry at this time, it was really, you could offer as much as, as Kakubri Academy, it could offer, uh, it, it had a distinguished headmaster, Dr. Poole, and it would offer uh, the, the classics, Latin, Greek, uh, mathematics, arithmetic, French, uh, history, geography, and so on. Um, one of our readings will cover his experiences or his reminiscences of, of life at Borg School, so I'll leave that for Donald to present to you later on. Um, next slide. And then of course, further up, further upstream, up the D is Kakubri itself. And this is a, an image uh, from a print of about 1845. And we're looking at Kakubri from the Twynham bank, uh, Twynham side, you've got Castle Sod just in the picture there. That's the ferry terminal from the Twynham parish bank. You can see um, the new parish church, 1838. You can see the lighthouse, 1842-43, and McClellan's Castle and so on, and the port, all, the all-important port. Now, Kakubi doesn't really, rather surprisingly, Kakubi doesn't really feature much in, in, um, in John's memoirs, certainly not the memoirs of his early life, up to the age of 18 or so, uh, simply because he didn't need to go there. Um, he went to school in Borg, um, it was difficult to get to Kukubri. You had to cross, cross the, the ferry, uh, which was, you know, relatively expensive and muddy and occasionally fatal to use the ferry. Uh, if you wanted to get across by a bridge, you had to go up to Tungland at this, in, in, in John's day, 1820s, 1830s, his early days. It was important, though, for uh, farmers. It was the uh, site of the agricultural market, cattle and sheep, and of course for the export of of animals uh, from the port through through the paddle steamers, like the the Countess of Galloway. That might be the Countess of Galloway. We can see uh, coming into the harbour here. Certainly a paddle steamer there coming up, and then um, St Mary's Isle is here i think it's a little bit of artistic license there to fit it into the picture uh, not quite strictly not quite accurate that that part of the uh, illustration but i think that's mary's isle and the next slide there's the building itself and now this, this is the seat of the earls of selkirk it's the center of the uh, extensive st mary's isle estate and uh, during the uh, during uh, John's youth, this, the sixth Earl came of age in 1830. He uh, attained his 21st birthday, and uh, the, um, the trustees, if you like, who had been running the estate for the last 10 years since, his, since the fifth Earl had died, uh, were disbanded, and, uh, and the sixth Earl took his place as the, uh, as the uh, proprietor of the estate, full proprietor of the estate. The, in later life, the connection with the St. Mary's Island estate was important for, for John's career um, because it did enable him to um, get the necessary introductions to follow a career in the, in the Royal Navy. Um, after finishing school, the memoirs tell us that he, well, I should have mentioned that at school he was certainly seems to have been a, a, an able mathematician. He was, he was good at uh, arithmetic and mathematics. He also had a strong interest in uh, model making. He, was, he had a mechanical engineering interest, you might say, and uh, uh, he, he was lent a book of um, drawings of machinery by the Reverend Samuel Smith, the then Minister of Borg, who, um, and, and he, he, he would make models from these drawings. So he was very good with his hands naturally, I think. And um, the obvious career for any boy, any boy with a mechanical um, mind was to go into millwriting at the time, to be a millwright. Uh, it would involve, you know, both woodworking, metalworking, design and so forth. 
and uh, he went to be um, after school he went to be a apprentice to a uh, millwright by the name of Bennett in Dundrenan. Dundrenan. And when he completed that uh, apprenticeship, he had in mind that he was really interested in getting into uh, maritime steam engines and um, eventually found work in a foundry or an engineering works in Dundee, uh, which was making such engines at the time. And uh, subsequently he moved down to Liverpool, in fact, to another company because he discovered that he could get more money by working in Liverpool and he was conscious of the need to, uh, you know, uh, certainly become self-supporting. He, um, he certainly didn't want to rely on his father because he was very conscious that the family had gone to quite some expense to put uh, John's older brother, Thomas, uh, through Borg Academy and also through Theological College. And in fact, uh, Thomas was um, a minister in, in 1843 in the parish of Monarchy up near Dundee as well. Um, so the two brothers for a, a brief spell were working in the same area uh, in Dundee. And, but uh, as I mentioned, John moved down to Liverpool to follow his career as a mechanical engineer. But his, his ultimate aim was actually to get into the Navy because he, he had the foresight to, to see that this was a, you know, a developing uh, career opportunity, uh, that uh, ships at the time, Navy ships were beginning to it, it, well, they were hybrid. Next slide, please, Carol. We'll see. Uh, this is this is in fact the last ship which uh, John Mickey served on as an engineer, and uh, it's a hybrid. It's obviously a, a sailing ship, but it's a sailing ship with with steam engines. And this is the um, uh, HMS Sultan, built in 1870, and it's classed as a broadside ironclad. Uh, broadside refers to the fact that the uh, the main guns were in batteries within the body of the within the hull of the ship you can see the big square openings or rectangular openings as opposed to turrets which we are more familiar with on, on warships uh, today turrets were beginning to come in at about this time but most of the uh, royal navy uh, ironclads were this type of battery um, uh, battery ironclad So in the course of his career, though, he, um, his Navy, naval career, he um, served in various fleets. He was in the Channel Fleet initially. He, um, even, he, he was even an engineer on the Royal Yacht Britannia. And um, on another occasion, he was in, in squadrons operating off the west coast of Africa in the uh, 1840s, 1850s, intercepting slavers, slave ships, because there was still a demand in the United States for slaves, but um, you know, Britain was uh, part of the uh, forces trying to prevent this, this trade. And uh, the, uh, his, his memoirs do actually uh, talk a lot about uh, intercepting slave ships and what they found and the conditions and so on uh, and so forth. I should mention, of course, that the uh, we've got 441 pages of this memoir, but uh, it's only the first 80 pages or so which are of particularly direct local history interest to ourselves. Uh, most of the memoirs deal with the, his, his naval career, which is very interesting itself. Um, and then the last 40 pages uh, cover his retirement years in Kikubri. Next slide. Now I'm indebted to uh, to Mike actually for um, for coming across this service certificate uh, in the Broughton House collection, uh, which uh, is issued uh, was issued to John on his leaving the Sultan as chief engineer. Um, it's uh, quite a glowing citation in, in 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 the middle there, written by Captain Van Sittart. Uh, ending with the fact that he's described as a perfect engineer. Uh, an odd, 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 advert, odd adjective to use of an engineer, perhaps, but uh, obviously better than being an imperfect engineer. And as an engineer, of course, he would be, you tend to think, well, he'd be, um, he'd be, he'd be to do with the engines. But in fact, he was, do, he was responsible for any mechanisms uh, operating on, the, on a ship. So that could be anything from you know, the uh, system to load the guns or the, um, 
uh, steerage, anything like that, anything mechanical was the uh, engineer's job. And uh, of course, at this time, I think the the image of the Scottish maritime engineer comes to the fore and uh, possibly, you know, John McKee was one of those. And of course, that particular um, literary style has come through even think of um, all those so all those of you who are fans of Star Trek, think of Scotty, the, the Scottish en engineer, beam me up Scotty on, on, the, on the Enterprise. Uh, maybe there's a, there's a connection there. Uh, next slide, please. Oh. Now, yeah, as I say, he retired after 25 years of service uh, in 1872. And um, he received a pension and was actually re promoted in retirement. He had, he'd retired as chief engineer, but during his retirement, he was, he was promoted further to fleet engineer, which in, uh, in terms of naval commissions is the equivalent of a, um, uh, of a commander. Um, so, you know, a middle ranking officer of, of uh, some standing. And at some time, not quite sure where, when, but uh, he built Anchor Lee, uh, next to next door to St Mary's Garage, but when he built the house, it would be the first or the last house you would see in St Mary Street, coming or, or leaving Kakubri, and uh, you can see uh, how it is today, and uh, the stable or coach house in in the back to, to, at the rear of the house there. Um, we know from various accounts, particularly that Galavidian article written about him in 1901, that he, he threw himself into all, all sorts of local projects. He was involved in the extension of the, the Bowling Green, for example. And uh, he was, we know from the census that he was living here in 1881. So I would imagine the house was built in the late, it, probably in the late 1870s. Um, yeah, he was involved in many local projects, but the most significant local project next line, Sarah, was the uh, establishment of the Stuartry Museum. Um, now, remember that the, the museum was first established on the top floor of what was then the, the new town hall in 18 uh, and opened in 1881. That's why the town hall has got those letters, library, museum around the outside at a high level but uh, the he and uh, ex provost samuel caven and george hamilton the sheriff clark were the key people involved in establishing the museum and uh, such was their success in acquiring adding to the collections that it was necessary to build a new museum uh, on a site given by the countess of selkirk uh, in 1882 and the museum opened in 1883. Next slide, Carol. And this is the interior of the museum, probably sometime in the 1890s. And uh, the central exhibit, um, the one you couldn't miss, was the, the elephant in the room, really. It's the, <laughs> the skeleton of an Indian elephant, um, which had been sent back by um, a Kukubri uh, boy who was working in a plantation and presumably got got the was received a copy of the Kukubrisha advertiser, the, the Galloway News of its day, uh, two or three months after its issue, presumably, and read about a new museum opening in Kukubri. And as it happened, he'd got this dead elephant on his hands, <laughs> falling down a drainage ditch. And he, he thought, ah, yes, just what Kukubri needs. An Indian elephant for the collections, and it was sent. The carcass apparently was sent um, to Garleston, and from Garleston brought to Kubri and turned up at Mr. McKee's door at Ankeley. Um, whether he knew it was coming, I don't know. But uh, anyway, not daunted, he set to, and um, I find this hard to believe. But apparently, had to render down the remains of the elephant. Um, you know, to get to the skeleton. Um, Donald's mother, Mary Grace, uh, recalls a family uh, story that the, um, the process of, rend of rending down the carcass 
was produced such an offensive smell that Kikubi was masked in it for weeks. And uh, he, he was a popular man, but his popularity must have been tested, I think, over that period. Um, so I'd like to get to the bottom of that particular story, but nevertheless, there it is. And uh, I think you can see from the, uh, the base and the framework, I, I would imagine that's all John McKee's work. He's, he's putting his engineering skills to, uh, into operation and you can't really fault it. I mean, you couldn't do a better job today, I don't think. Um, we don't know who the man is sitting by the, the, um, the skeleton there, but uh, I can certainly tell you the chair that he's sitting on is still in the museum, but, but, but sadly the, the elephant uh, departed when the museum was reorganized and, and, and uh, it, was, it was agreed that it should really focus on local things, that there wasn't really a place for Indian elephants or, or Ma Maori weapons or all the sort of things which museums tended to collect in those days. And it, was, it went to the um, Chamber Street Museum and is now is still part of the National Museum of Scotland collection. So it's, uh, it's still around. Um, next slide. So certainly McKee was, was very active in the museum for at least 20 years. And uh, by the time that Galavidian article was written and perhaps prompted um, Perhaps in that year, he was certainly thinking of retiring. I mean, he was, he was getting on. He was uh, 80, he'd reached his 80th birthday. And the gist of the article in the Galavidian is that, oh, it, we, we really must be sure that his work is carried on. So I think he was definitely thinking of, of stepping down. And, uh, but this particular portrait here, this, is, this was painted by uh, William Stuart McGeorge, one of the Kikubi School of, of Artists. Uh, Castle Douglas man himself. Uh, this was painted in uh, 1914 or maybe 1915 uh, when John was 93. Um, and in fact, he, he must have, this must be just three or f three to six months before for John actually died. Um, but the story doesn't quite end there because if we, if we go to the next slide, um, there's a particularly um, unusual uh, grave and headstone in the uh, in, in St Cuthbert's in Kirkyard and it's in the form of a, uh, a ship's binnacle, the, uh, the housing for a ship's compass uh, made of granite, next slide, and bears the inscription. Um, it's, it's, it's inscribed to Mary Car Carnican, John's second wife, and then to John himself as fleet engineer and uh, I think it gives the date of his death in March 1915. Um, but over the top, perhaps you can just see that, dinner forget. Um, and I don't think we've forgotten you, John. That's why we're here tonight. And uh, it would seem a good point to pass on to uh, Donald now to, um, to read some of his, his memoirs. So we'll keep uh, we'll keep his portrait on the screen so we can we can oversee the proceedings for the rest of the evening with his, his uh, benign gaze, I think, looking down on his great grand, great great grandson. So Donald's going to read five excerpts from the memoirs, which I hope at the end you'll agree um, show the social historical value of of, of these reminiscences of, of John McKee. They cover the early history of, uh, of the man is, is up to the age of 18, going through school and so on, uh, up to the time when he uh, was, was uh, going to be an apprentice millwright. So the first one, uh, and I'll introduce, give a short introduction to each, is, uh, is John's reminiscences of a life at Borg Academy. Thank you. David mentioned that uh, John had an older brother, Thomas, who went on to become a minister. And this uh, excerpt starts at the point where, that Thomas has left Borg uh, and uh, gone on to theological college. He begins, I was now alone at school. 
it was very seldom that anything happened to break the usual routine. I got a prize every year as long as I attended regularly and had therefore a better record than most. Yet I cannot look back on those days with any degree of gratification. There was a vicious tone throughout the school. Constant fights took place among the boys. Good manners were treated with derision. Being ill-bred was thought to be manly and the language in use was rivaled. The masters made no attempt whatever to gain the respect and confidence of the scholars, invariable and promiscuous thrashing being held as the only panacea for every evil. I learned more at school after I left school than I did all the time I was at school. Though this may seem paradoxical, it was in this way. Your grandfather had a pretty hard struggle to give your uncle Tom, his brother, his education at school and the theological college, so that when I became able to earn something, I was taken from school during summer and worked as required, for which I received eightpence per day. That looks but a small sum now, yet it was the ordinary wage of a woman or boy for outdoor farm work at that time, a man's wage being seven and six to nine shillings a week. I went to school in winter. It was then I went in for mathematics, which stood me afterwards in good stead in my naval service examinations. I had by this time got sense enough to appreciate the value of education. For while at regularly at school, the chief consideration was to get the day put in without a fight or a thrashing. You have anything to say on that? The second uh, excerpt is um, about Lord Selkirk's coming of age. And remember that John, of course, was in a, in a farm uh, that was on the estate. <clears throat> the next event specially fixed in my memory is the coming of age of Lord Selkirk. Extensive preparations were made to give the young Lord, as he was then locally called, a hearty welcome. On almost every farm on the estate, a bonfire had been prepared, certainly on all those who from any part of which a peep could be got of St. Mary's Isle. A superabundance of wood was cut in the different plantations to provide fuel for the bonfires. Your grandfather had enough taken to build a bulky bonfire in that part of the field, Anchor Wai, from which a good view of St. Mary's Isle could be had. The surplus he took to himself, which kept the house fire going for many a day. There was a great excitement the night the bonfire was lighted and no end of cheering when his lordship's health was drunk. Whiskey was cheap in those days and I think there must have been an abundant supply as the health of his mother, the countess, was also drunk. Likewise that of the younger ladies, his sisters. By the time all this had been got through, the gathering around the fire became quite jubilant. William Gordon was your father's, grandfather's hired man at that time. He was married and his wife and family lived at the old Black Craig. William was a slow, heavy, good-natured man, dull and usually silent, but Tibby, his wife, was a nipper. They, together with old Kate Halliday and Bob Manson, caused some fun in this way. The eyes of Kate had either been dazzled by the glare of the fire or had got confused through drinking as many healths, which upset her local bearings, and led her to believe that the bonfire on Culraven Drum, which was not burning very brightly, was old Black Craig House on fire. She cried out, Lord, help us, old Black Craig is all in fire, and began running as she supposed in that direction. Tibby Gordon, the nipper, raised the yell, my poor wains, my poor wains, save them, save them or they will be burned to death, and started running after old Kate at her utmost speed. Bob Manson jumped astride the dyke and cried, I'll ride and save the wains. He kept rising up and down as if he had been on horseback. 
William looked after his wife and Kate, spanking away full tilt, and in his usual spe slow speech said, What's tain the wife? I think she man gay gone gait. And if a translation is required, what has happened to my wife? I think she's gone daft. <laughs> After Kate and Tibby had been called back and Bob descended from his stone steed, they had a good laugh over it, the fire having burned low and the supply of whiskey most likely exhausted. After a final cheer, all steered as steadily as they could for home. Uh, thanks, Don. The, th the third extract that uh, Don's going to read is really interesting from a local history point of view because it's an account of the first Kakubi regatta, which was held in 1836. So this was uh, a regatta. This was a uh, essentially a you know rowing race, sailing race. Um, held on the River Dee, starting at Kukubri, I think, and, and coming up towards um, towards the Borg Shore, the Twynham Shore, the Borg Shore. And um, the museum actually has the regulations and uh, rules, if you like, for the operation of the regatta. And yes, it's reported in newspapers at the time, but this is the first you know, personal vivid account of, of the occasion. And he writes really well about it, I think, as I hope you'll agree. John had been granted some special dispensation to leave school early to go and see this spectacle. The moment I got out from school, I started for home at my utmost speed. They had all gone to the regatta except your grandmother, and I am sure that I must have given her a start, rushing in all hurry and excitement to be off again. I got something to eat which I bolted with all dispatch while getting into my Sunday clothes, and with a piece in my hand started. I did not let any grass grow under my feet, you may be sure. When I reached the top of Newton Hill and came in sight of the boats gay with flags, the great crowd along the bank of the river made the grandest display I have ever seen. Nearly all those from Borg and Twynham remained on their side of the river. Lady Anne Murray's band was stationed on the Twynham side. I had never seen or heard a band play before and I thought it just splendid. There would be about a dozen or fifteen bandsmen. They were tastefully dressed in blue, piped with white and they all belonged to Gatehouse, and a large number from that district came with them. There never had been such a crowd seen in Kirkubri before. The weather was all that could be desired, and the novelty of the affair proved a great attraction. There were a number of boats belonging to men employed in the two shipbuilding yards at that time, besides those belonging to fishermen and coasting vessels. But with the exception of a six-oared gig, which I believe belonged to William Gordon, the procurator fiscal. At least it was always kept at his boathouse. None of them were built for racing. John Finlay, the distiller, had a boat, specially designed and built by John Murray, the joiner. It could hardly be called a four-oared gig, though it was finer in the lines than that any of the other boats. It was painted white and named the Spectre manned by the Wishers, and won every prize for which it competed. I could not tell how many races there were, but I mind one was won by a canoe belonging to Sir John Gordon, who had not then been long in Borg. I was close beside him when it came in the winner, and though he was a very stout man, he jumped about and cheered until purple in the face. The yeomanry cavalry being embodied at that time, their handsome uniform with the large silver scales on the shoulders brightened up the gathering. They were an exceptionally fine body of men. Very few of them were under five foot eight inches in height, and the great majority were from five feet ten inches to six feet. A local poet sang, such gallant army ne'er was seen in Galloway before, 
and such a valiant host I when will ne'er appear there more. A number of them had their horses on the Twynham side and rode along the river bank opposite the racing boats, which added to the gaiety of the scene. Pretty high jinks must have been carried on in the yeomanry mess. I have had a number of their mess bills through my hands. The amount of liquor got through is from our standpoint surprising, but it was a drinking age. It used to be an accepted truism that a Borg farmer never got home from Kirkubri Market on the day he started for it. <laughs> I think. Thank you, Donald. That's, a, that's one of the best uh, excerpts, I think, one, or sections of passages of the, of the book. Um, there are so many different things we, we could have, you know, uh, presented a, a number of uh, all sorts of different topics to you. There are superstitions in the book. Uh, there are reflections on um, well, local people, a lot on local people. Uh, there's there's uh, all sorts uh, in, in there. And um, the next one is a sort of reflection on, um, on the environment uh, of the time, the environment of the farm, because um, in 18, the, these 1820s, 1830s, the um, estate, like many others in Scotland, was showing an interest in, in, um, in shooting, in, in, in game management for, for shooting. And uh, gamekeepers are introdu introduced at this time. And uh, of course, anything that couldn't be uh, considered as game was a vermin and really you know, a waste of space and had to be eradicated. And in this particular instance, we'll, we'll hear of fumarts. Uh, in other words, the Scottish word for what we call a polecat now. And uh, clearly in these days, there were lots of, of fumarts um, in the area. Um, today, uh, they're very rare in, in the Stuart Tree. There's maybe a few uh, around the Fleet Valley and uh, there's a few in the, in the Nith Valley as well, but really a rare mammal in this part of uh, in this part of Scotland, and um, Donald will read the account referring to that. The Earl of Selkirk was the first to begin strict game preserving in the Stewartry with a staff of active gamekeepers. The destruction of vermin, which they termed everything not game, being their first consideration. The chief keeper told me that in a comparatively short time, he trapped over 300 fumarts. In proof of how bold and numerous they were before the systematic trapping of them began, one summer afternoon, your grandfather, James, was attacked by five of them. I have told you before how the cattle used to be troubled, much troubled in summer with red water and therefore required constant watching. He had left the hayfield to have a look through them and so did not, as usual, carry a stick. The dog had left his foot or his side and gone after some young wild duck in one of the lochens. He was walking along quietly with his hands behind his back, as was his usual custom, when on going over a now, he surprised five fumarts who were basking in the sun. They at once set on him and having nothing to defend himself, took to his heels and they after him. As they were about to get a hold of him, he threw down his hat, which delayed them a little. The dog, which he had been whistling on while he ran, then came and being a hard-mouthed collie, at once tackled the fiercest fumart, which it soon managed to kill. The others during this struggle had made their escape into a bank of winds. He took care ever after never to be in the fields without a substantial walking stick. And the, um, the last uh, excerpt we'd like to share with you, um, in this we'll hear more about the, uh, some of the neighbors and the local characters we've some of them have been introduced already. 
celebrating the uh, coming of age of the uh, of the Earl of Selkirk around the bonfire, etc. And uh, we'll hear we'll hear about a few more now from Donald. And actually, we'll this part ends on a rather tragic story, which relates to the um, indirectly relates to the cholera outbreak in Dumfries in 1832 and 33. Jenny Clellan, who although married to a little man named Bennett, Jenny herself stood six feet in height and having the most marked individuality. She always got her name, maiden name, Clellan. She had several, <coughs> several grandsons who were sailors. They used to bring her tea and dainties from abroad. After getting a supply, your mother had always to go and partake. I recollect having once been with her. How it came about, I don't know, as it was always Auntie Maggie who was the favoured one. The table had three legs, and about halfway down there was a shelf on which bread or anything could be placed if the table was crowded. Her good man, that's Bennett, had a dog called Chance. The pig, which on ordinary occasions had pretty well the run of the house, came in to have a look around as usual. His presence, however, could not be tolerated when there were visitors. So the good man, who spoke through his nose, said, Watch him, Chance, watch him, Chance. Chance did not move when told, but had evidently made up his mind. If the pig advanced beyond a certain point, he would deal with it, which eventually Master Piggy did. Chance without warning, made a dash at him, and he made a bolt for the door, throw, threw below the table. His back caught the shelf and carried the table with all the tea equipage halfway across the floor, and strange to say, there was not an article broken or capsized. <laughs> this was attributed to Jenny's occult power, which neighbors said went beyond the bounds of natural knowledge. Speaking of her great height, which was a peculiarity of the Clellans, reminds me of Geordie McClellan, who lived at Black Craig, and the fright he gave your grandmother, and indeed more or less the whole household. At that time, <coughs> cholera was devastating the country, being very fatal at Dumfries. It caused a great scare in the district, and many nostrums were pres prescribed for its cure. Among others, brandy and salt. Geordie evidently held that prevention was the better than cure, so took brandy and salt until he got crazed. He came to your grandmother, who did not know he had been drinking, and told her he had just made his escape from a gang of robbers who had plundered his house and murdered his wife. This, of course, put your grandmother in a great state of mind. She rushed in and told your grandfather the dreadful news, which Geordie continued to affirm was true. They gave him a little whiskey to steady his nerves, and your grandfather, who was then in the prime of life and not easily scared, he and William Halliday each took a heavy walking stick and together with Geordie started for Black Craig, but on getting near there, he bolted. They, however, went on and learned from his wife that it was the brandy and salt which was accountable for his delusion. The next morning, he was found perched on the roof of Ochenhay House. They had great difficulty in getting him down, as he was a huge man, being six foot six inches in height. This escapade brought on the illness from which he died. Well, a slightly tragic note to end on there, but um, certainly um, these early pages, the first 80 pages of, of, of John's memoirs really do give us a, a lovely account. Well, I think a, he's such a good writer and must have had a great memory. I mean, to, to, if he's writing this in his 
70s or 80s, um, you know, he's, he's able to recall these incidents uh, so well and, uh, and, and write so, so well about them. So I think hopefully from these five excerpts, I hope we've demonstrated the value of the memoirs as, as a record of local social history. And um, we're indebted to, uh, to Bud Gordon for uh, giving these to us uh, to enable us to uh, carry out further research. And um, we didn't know this, but um, Donald's uh, mother, Mary Grace Bradley in Canada, also had access to a copy, a photocopy of these, these records, and has transcribed all 441 pages. So when we were considering what to do uh, with this opportunity we had, with, with the acquisition of the memoirs, the first part of the job, well, we thought, well, we must publish these in some way. Um, but then discovering that, in fact, there had been a transcription um, of, the, of the memoirs. And, um, although John McKee writes very clearly, some of his lettering is a bit unique. Uh, he's got a unique style of, of <laughs> some letter formations. Um, and uh, but that that part of the exercise had been done by uh, Donald's mother, uh, Mary Grace. So so we had a head start really uh, when it came to thinking about how to publish uh, this. But um, it's, uh, the committee your committees agreed that we should proceed with this. And uh, you may remember that uh, uh, I think I, earlier this year was it or at the end of last year we appealed to yourselves as members to uh, if there's anybody interested in volunteering to do the background research to um, to these memoirs, particularly on things like places, people and events. Um, it would make a, a much more informative booklet if not only we could publish the text, but also a commentary uh, to explain the, the various backgrounds and contexts for it. It would make it a, a really useful historical document. And uh, I must thank all those researchers who volunteered from the society to um, to do the work most of that's complete now and so in the coming months uh, donald and i were sitting down and um, editing the commentary obviously not editing the text there's a few spelling mistakes in john mckee's text which we should deal with but really adding a commentary uh, to create a, a, a publication which i think will be a, a very useful local history resource for many years to come so I hope, I hope that's a bit of interest to you tonight and uh, thank you all for coming again and, and so on and uh, thank you Donald for your readings. Well, thank you. <laughs>